answer any questions at the end, um, but if I don't get to answer them or, or, or if they only come to you later, don't hesitate to send any questions you may have to me by email. Uh, on the uh, you, you have my email address, obviously, because because uh, because you're you're here. I'll reply to everybody as soon as I can. So let's. Uh, where's my mask on? Here we go. So this is the the first of three presentations. The next one on the seventeenth of February is a spotlight on the on the ultra fondo. Uh, which is significantly tougher than the Marmot, which is already a very tough uh, day out. Uh, so we'll have a special spotlight on the 17th. And then on the 2nd of June, uh, the, uh, uh, the focus will be how to get your best result on the day. So it's, it's all about, I'm, I'm here now today, how do I do the, the best possible performance uh, with what I've got uh, on the day? So uh, that's always a very popular one. And um, uh, I'm proud to say people, people find that one particularly useful. So, so do come back for that. Now, so let's get into this one now. Uh, just a quick uh, uh, you know, setting in context, the Marmot Alps, uh, you, 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 you all uh, presumably know what it is. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a tough, it's a very, very tough day out. 177 kilometers of, uh, of distance, 5,000 meters of climbing, and 65 kilometers of actual climbing. To, to make up those uh, 5,000 meters. That's a huge amount of climbing. Uh, it's a major physical and mental challenge uh, for, uh, uh, for people who've, who haven't done it before. And even for people who've ridden it before, you know, I, 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 at the end of every marmot, I say to myself, never again. And yet I come back. I, I'm not sure why, but uh, <laughs> it's always a major physical and mental challenge. It doesn't matter. So long as you're trying to do uh, to, to do as, as well as you can, it's always going to be a challenge. Okay, so there are four climbs. Um, it's the uh, uh, there are two long descents, uh, so those are important as well. Uh, there are two valleys: uh, the valley of the Morienne uh, in in the midsection here, and the, the valley of the Oison. Once you're off the Galibier, all of this is basically a long a long valley, long false flat with a couple of bumps at the end. To finish this uh, event is something to be proud of. Uh, there are many people who, there are millions of people, of course, who, 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 didn't, who couldn't possibly finish it. There are many who try and fail. Every year there are hundreds of riders who abandon, um, and, and of course more if the weather is bad. So if you do finish, you can be proud of yourself. It is a serious challenge. Just uh, one, um, Point to bear in mind, it's not of relevance for this evening, really, uh, but to, we'll come back on this on the 2nd of June. The uh, descent of the Col du Glenon is not timed, so the, the event is not timed from it fully from beginning to end. It's timed from the start to the top of the Glendon, and then again from the bottom of the Glendon, the other side, to the finish. So that section is untimed for basically for safety, uh, safety reasons. Uh, and again, we'll look at the consequences of that on June the 2nd. It's not especially relevant this evening. All right, so what does it take to do well? But before, before we can talk about how to train for it, we need to understand what it takes to do well at the moment. Uh, uh, otherwise, we're, we're talking in a vacuum. But doing well only really makes sense in the context of your objectives. So we need to look at those first. It's a quick uh, page on objectives. There are perhaps four different objectives that people might have at the moment. Uh, the first uh, is, is the most obvious one, but it only applies to a very small number of people, is, is to win it. Uh, you, you, if you win the Marmot, you're guaranteed fame for life in France. It's, it's, a, real, uh, uh, it, 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 it's a real mark of a, of a top uh, amateur cyclist. A very small number of people have a real chance of winning. At the most, 10 or 15 uh, each year have, 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 a, have a slight chance. There's really only four or five. Uh, that have a real chance of winning. So the, the, the objective that most people are working towards is a personal best, do the best they possibly can on the day and, the, and therefore train to, uh, to that end. I would, my guess is, I have no data on this, but my guess is 50 or 60% of people riding the Marmot are aiming at a personal best. And then the remainder, the remainder just want to finish. 
Uh, and that's and there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. That's absolutely no shame at all. To be a finisher of the Marmot is, is already something you can be seriously proud of. So that's a, a very, very valid objective just to finish. And then there's a fourth one, which is important, perhaps, at, uh, uh, which can be combined with, with any of the others, which is to enjoy the day out and enjoy the ride. You know, we're, we're not professional. We do this for fun. Uh, so it should be fun. Uh, and it will be fun if you've properly prepared, if you're ready for, for all eventualities, if you're trained, if you've trained hard, uh, if you're fit, uh, if you've got the skills and, and, and so on and so on. It will be, it, or it should be fun anyway. So that's, uh, that's what we're aiming at. So this presentation is, is really about uh, the people going for a personal best, although there's obviously plenty for people who, who, who are just aiming to finish as well. Um, and, and it's also all about acquiring those skills and the, and, and the ability to, to enjoy the ride while you're doing it. Okay, so now let's look at the demands of the event itself. So what, 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 what are, what you, you, you can't put together an effective training plan without understanding these. So the first one is physiological. It's obviously a very, very physical event. Uh, it's an endurance event. Um, and the key, uh, the first and most important is to have excellent aerobic endurance. Uh, meaning you can keep going for a very long time. Um, the best will finish in around six and a half hours. Um, the last people to finish take around 14 hours. So if you're going to finish, you will be somewhere between six and a half and 14 hours. You know, the majority of people will probably come in uh, around uh, nine, 10, 11 hours in, in that sort of range. Uh, that's a lot of time to spend on the bike climbing, climbing mountains. So you need excellent aerobic endurance. But because there's a lot of climbing, the higher your power to weight ratio, the better. In the other words, the, the higher power you've got, the better, and the lower weight you have, the better. And, and obviously that's total weight, you and your bike, uh, but it generally costs a lot less to lose a kilo of your, of your body than it costs to take a kilo off your bike. Um, and uh, some people I know would uh, benefit from losing a lot more than one kilo. So, so it's important to look, at, uh, to look at both power and weight if you want to do well at an event like the Marmot. The next set of demands are psychological. Uh, it's very, very tough. So you need to be psychologically strong. Uh, you need to be able to maintain your focus and maintain your motivation on the long climbs uh, and throughout a very long day. Uh, the weather might be bad. You've got to still keep going if you want to finish. Uh, you've got to be able to stay positive and deal with the inevitable tiredness, the inevitable setbacks, the moments when you you, you can have moments of uh, of feeling very strong and moments of feeling very weak, and and you never you never really understand why. Um, you can have negative thoughts uh, which come to you, and you, you just you've got to be able to deal with that. So the stronger you are psychologically, uh, the better. There are technical uh, elements to it. Obviously, cycling is a technical sport, and, and especially in the mountains, uh, you need excellent climbing skills for long climbs and varied gradients. Uh, and uh, you need uh, excellent descending skills and, and particularly cornering skills. Uh, you could lose a, a surprising amount of time by being a poor descender on the marmot. You, you could easily lose half an hour when you when you add up uh, all, the, uh, all the descents. So well worth investing time to descend uh, faster and oft, oft, the two generally that go together once you've learned good technique you're also going to descend more safely so you may be going faster than before but more safely with better technique i strongly recommend that uh, it's a big gain in time and above all there's no physical effort involved uh, so uh, so it's uh, money for old rope it's your free speed okay and then the final uh, demand of the event is tactical um, and for those of us um, who are going for personal best and have no chance of winning, uh, it, the, re the tactic is really, or well, the tactics really turn around knowing when is the right moment to push yourself hard and when you should be backing off and conserving energy. Okay, we're not going to talk about that today. We'll come back on that on the 2nd of June, uh, but that's an important part of the event demands. Really, the most important uh, we'll be working on uh, during your training plan, of course, are the uh, above all, physiological and technical, and then the psychological tends to come with the physiological because the more you get used to pushing yourself hard doing long distance, the stronger you become mentally as well. 
but I do have some extra resources on uh, mental strength for the mama that you can find on the website on my blog if you're you're interested to go further. All right, so with that out of the way, let's uh, start talking about the personal training plan. Uh, a personal training plan is a bit like a set of route directions, uh, you know, the sort of thing you see on uh, Google, you know, take uh, uh, when you've mapped out your route on Google, it then gives you a list. And the list says, you know, take such and such a road for 200 meters, then turn left, and then after half a mile, you turn right, and so on and so forth. That's only useful to manage your journey if the starting and finishing points are correct, and if it takes your personal constraints into account. But the thing is, everybody, every one of these cyclists is unique in terms of their starting points, their finishing points, and their constraints. So the, the set of unique directions which, are, which, which, uh, which a rigid training plan provides is, uh, is, is potentially uh, useless. Someone likely to finish in the top 500 or in less than seven, uh, seven hours, seven and a quarter hours, needs a very different plan to someone who will take 10 to 12 hours to finish. It's absolutely not the same sort of event. The closer to the front, the more it's like a race. People really are racing up, up the front. The closer to the back, the more it's a pure endurance ride. It's almost an, an Aldax, if you will. I mean, people are, people are just riding the course. They're, they're just trying to finish. Uh, it's not a race uh, in any normal sense of, of, of the term. So preparing yourself for one or the other is, is clearly different. You know, those are obviously two extremes, but in the middle, there's plenty of variation as well. So a generic plan is suboptimal at best and potentially damaging. And so we're not providing one. Uh, the plan we are proposing is a framework and a set of guidelines. And my goal is to give you the data and the knowledge uh, uh, and, and, and the, guide, uh, you know, the, the guidelines, if you will, which allow you to think carefully about the process and then take responsibility for your own preparation. Okay? And if you want help with that, obviously we're willing to do that, but then, then, uh, uh, then we'll have to ask you to pay us, I'm afraid. So. You know, uh, this is as I'm trying to give you as much as I can um, up front this way. So the principles, there are six key principles to think about as you put together your training plan. The first is you've got to build a very strong aerobic base. OK, you need to be able to ride hard for several hours without having to ease off. Uh, you need to do this. You're going to train predominantly at low intensity. All the endurance adaptations that you need can be obtained at low intensity and the advantage is you don't get develop unnecessary fatigue. When I first started uh, cycling and training for, for events like this, I used to ride every ride as hard as I possibly could. But I didn't know any better. I thought that was the right way to train. I was permanently tired. And yes, because I was a beginner, I got better fast and I got better several, for a couple of years doing that. But I was permanently tired and I soon ran into a plateau and, and the same will happen to you. So I've seen that happen to dozens and dozens of people. OK, so when you're building a strong aerobic base, you need to ride at low intensity and it makes no it, it makes no sense at all to push hard. Second principle is to do as much climbing as possible. You know, this is a highly mountainous event, so you can only do so much preparation uh, on in the flat. You can, obviously, if you live in the flat, that's a problem. Uh, I, I fully recognize that. There are two ways around it. One is obviously uh, find whatever hills you possibly can and use them as much as you can. The other, the other which works quite well these days, of course, is to have a, a, a smart trainer, a, a turbo trainer, uh, jack up the front wheel so your, your bike's at an angle so it simulates climbing better. And then um, you know, go, and, go and climb any one of the climbs that you can find on, on whichever is your favorite smart trainer app. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a lot, lot, lot better than riding on the flat. At least the, 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 the coup de pedal, as they call it in French, the pedaling sensation is much closer to what it is on a real climb than, 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 than it is on the flat. The other thing you can do on the flat, of course, if there's a strong headwind is you can sit up sit up and ride into the headwind with a, with a high gear. That, that's, that, that can help as well, though obviously you're, you're still flat rather than on a slope. Okay, as much climbing as possible. 
The third principle is to, is to build uh, some short-term muscular endurance. Uh, this is, the purpose of this is if you're going to be uh, trying to race a bit, trying to do your best possible result, then you want this in order to be able to close gaps on the group, particularly in the two valleys, um, to stay with the group and, and, and of course to power up short climbs. You know, particularly going up the Morian Valley, there are a number of little short climbs where you can get dropped by a group. There are a number of road junctions and so on where you can get dropped. Uh, you need to be able to close those gaps very, very quickly. Otherwise, you're in for a very hard effort. Um, so short-term muscular endurance means the ability to do a, a, you know, a quick 30-second, one-minute, two-minute effort to do that. The faster you are, or the faster you are, or the faster you, you hope to be, the more important this is. If your goal is just to finish the marmot, this is of relatively little importance. Next principle is to increase the load progressively. Uh, you've got to build up to a pretty high load. If you try to go too quickly, uh, you're likely to injure yourself. So do be careful about the, the progressivity uh, or, uh, that you increase the load. You know, don't, uh, don't do anything silly. Rest and recovery is the fifth principle. That's absolutely essential. Um, as you probably know, as you should know, uh, training breaks the body down. It doesn't make you stronger. Uh, it actually makes you weaker. What makes you stronger is the recovery after training. So if you keep training and never give yourself time to recover, you're just digging a deeper and deeper hole and you can eventually flip over into overreaching and then overtraining. And then you never, it's really, really, and then it becomes a serious problem. You can take months or years to get back out of it. So uh, build in recovery, it's absolutely essential. Essential is not too strong a word. It is literally essential. And finally, the sixth, the sixth principle is uh, cycling is a highly technical sport, so you should never stop uh, developing your technical skills, of which the most important ones for the marmot are clearly climbing and descending. Bike racing is not only about uh, FTP and VO2 max. You know, you've, you've got, if you're not a skilled bike rider, you'll, uh, you're a danger for yourself and for others. So this is important as well. Okay, the framework we propose is, uh, has three phrases to it, th phrases, phases to it. Uh, the first being preparation, which lasts for two and a half months. The second, pre-competition, another two and a half months. And then finally, competition. So in the preparation, the competition phase is just the last couple of weeks where you're basically tapering and then, then actually uh, competing. Uh, the preparation phase, the, the basic goal is to prepare your body for an increased training load. The pre-competition phase is that increased training load where you're really loading yourself up, you're applying a lot of training stress in order to force the adaptations that you want. And then finally, you reduce the, the, the load and, the, and try and eliminate fatigue in the, in the taper, the competition period, so that you arrive ready to, uh, to race um, as fit as you've ever been, but um, um, without fatigue. So here's the, the framework plan that uh, you may have seen already on the Marmot website. It's available there. Um, I forgot to check today whether it should be updated now for the 2022 uh, version of this uh, plan. This is a, a last year's, I think that we're looking at there. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's essentially the same. It, it's, it's essentially the same with a few minor changes here and there. Uh, so this is again, a framework, okay, which you, which you, you need to adapt. If you don't find it, if you don't find the right one on the Marmot website or can't find it, then just send me a request by, by email. Okay? So it's a framework and not a detailed day-to-day -day training plan. <coughs> and uh, the goal is you understand the reasoning. So that's why when you look at the way this thing is actually structured, we've got the dates here, of course. These are the phases I mentioned, the three big phases. Uh, these are the, the mini cycles, the meso cycles that I'll talk about in a second. This is the training load, the variation in training load, arbitrary units, one to five, where one is minimum, five is maximum. And then here uh, for each um, phase, I've got, uh, I've listed what the training focus should be on the bike and off the bike. We'll talk about these in detail, of course, in a minute. And then what the rationale for it is. So why it's important to do these particular things. Okay, so you can study all that at your leisure uh, later. I'm not gonna comment it in, in detail uh, uh, just now. Um, so each of these um, 
main phases is broken down into four so-called mesocycles in which you've got to three weeks where you steadily increase the load and then one week where you reduce it dramatically. And then three more weeks where you increase and then one week where you reduce it. So the reduce week is obviously the recovery week. Uh, and it's important to, to, to bear that type of structure in mind. If you're 50 years or older, there's a school of thought, there's quite a lot of evidence. So Joe Friel in particular argues for this, uh, that it's better to adopt a three week cycle uh, where you have two load weeks and one recovery week. And the reason is because as we get older, we it takes us longer to recover. Now there's yet another school of thought which says that all of this is too rigid. Um, the recovery week is not necessarily, uh, doesn't necessarily fall at the right moment, blah, 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 and nor does the load week. So I need to be much more flexible, which is fine. Uh, that's that's uh, just being pragmatic. And therefore um, take recovery when you feel you need it. And that's absolutely fine as well. That's rather, that tends to be the way I work myself. Um, I, I recover when I feel I need to rather than on some rigid schedule. Uh, the most, but it is essential to remember that you must take these uh, recovery periods as soon as you feel a need for it. Uh, some people need a full week, others need only three or four days. So up to you to, uh, to, uh, to feel for yourself what you need. Okay, let's move on to the second page of the, 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 the plan framework. On the second page, you've got um, the, the first, the left hand part's the same. On the right, we've got typical training weeks and um, some sample workouts for the, a typical training week, whether it's a high volume week or a recovery week, and then some guidelines on strength and conditioning that I'll come to in a second. Okay, so the, the main comment I'd make here is that, again, the harder you intend to race, the more you need to do in terms of intervals and high intensity, uh, but it should never be more than two sessions per week. Um, and it's questionable whether you really, you know, it, it depends on you whether you really need to do that. Uh, I would only recommend as many as two a week if you are, already have a very, very well-established aerobic base, if you've got a very high level of aerobic endurance. If, if that's the case, then fine, then you can, you've, you, you've got that foundation and you can, you can put the cherry on the cake. The point being that the high intensity will give you the cherry, uh, but it won't give you the cake. There is no way high intensity will do anything for your cake, which is your basic uh, aerobic endurance. That you've got to build. Uh, there are no shortcuts. It's time on the bike um, at low intensity. Okay, so that is the priority for 99% of, of people, if we're honest. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you should never do any intensity. It just means be sensible about it. Okay, so by all means, have some fun from time to time attacking on uh, short hills or sprinting for a road sign at the entrance of a town or whatever it may be. But don't do it too often and, and, and don't do lots of structured sessions. Uh, they just uh, detract from the, the main priority. Okay, so that's uh, that's the plan that you can the plan framework you can find. Now, how to customize that for yourself? Really, you, you just need to be pragmatic about it um, and to work out what your constraints are. In fact, really, that's the starting point, uh, especially your training time availability. So, be realistic about it. Uh, it's better to confirm it with your partner and your and your family right up front because that'll save a lot of misunderstanding and arguments later. Um, which days of the week can you train and for how long? Uh, what are the family or work commitments in the next few months that you that, that, that you, you that you can't do anything about that will prevent you from training on certain days or weeks, and so on and so forth. So list those out, um, put them in the plan, and then build your plan around them. You can see here, you know, uh, this this in this example here, there's an Easter holiday with family. There'll be no training at all that week. Fine. So that's obviously going to be a recovery week. Therefore, the week before should be training at the maximum possible. It won't always work that way. Sorry, it went on slightly quicker than I intended. Uh, it won't always work that way. Um, you'll probably end up with something that's quite a long way from ideal, but that's just the way it is. That's just life. Uh, adjust things as you can. Um, and um, you, know, you just have to make the most of it, make the best of it. Okay, so let's get into the, uh, into the, the reality of it. Uh, in the preparation phase, uh, what we're trying to achieve is to, first of all, to build your training capacity, your ability to train, your ability to, uh, to put in uh, 10, 12 hours a week without falling apart uh, and to ride long distances. And, and of course, by doing that, we're building aerobic endurance at, at the same time. 
Uh, the second objective is to work on technical skills. The early part of the year is a great time to do that. Uh, descending and cornering at speed, um, climbing uh, wh wherever you can find a hill. Uh, obviously, you're not going to be in the Alps at this time of year, but uh, wherever you can find some sort of a hill uh, to practice climbing, that's, uh, and, and particularly the technical aspects of climbing. Uh, and then the third objective, if it's relevant to you, is to uh, is to build VO2 max and short-term muscular endurance. So that's the uh, that, that requires a little bit of intensity work. Again, it's a much higher priority if you're a faster rider and you're aiming to to do the best you can and maybe finish in the top thousand or or two thousand. So what do you need to do in this period? On the bike, first of all. So it's about progressing long rides from wherever you are today out to five, five, six hour rides by the end of March in zone one, zone two, zone two, okay? What is zone two? That's below the aerobic uh, threshold. Uh, I remind you, there are two thresholds, the aerobic and the anaerobic. The anaerobic is the higher one. That's the one most people mean when they talk about their threshold. But there's also this very important lower one called the aerobic threshold, which is the point at which your lactates your production of lactate starts to rise above its base level. Um, it's typically for most riders, it's going to be around 70 to 75% of your HR max or of your FTP. Curious enough, the percentage is about the same by coincidence. If in doubt, it's better to be on the cautious side. You're gonna get all the adaptations you need by riding below that level. You're going to, you know, the main adapt adaptations you're looking for are, are increased capillarization of your muscles and increased mitochondria in your muscles. All, all of those things happen at these low intensities. If you ride harder, you're not going to get any more adaptation. You're just going to be more tired, which will prevent you from doing a, a, another long ride uh, next time or potentially prevent you the next time. Around. Okay, the ride should feel slow. It took me a while to get my head around this and to get used to it, but it, they feel slow until, until, you, until you've gotten used to it. So 80% of your training at least should be like this, including of course, as much low intensity climbing as possible. Do some exercises for your technical skills. So I, I, I can't go into details on that now, but we've got um, quite a lot of stuff on our website on, the, on how to, you know, the technical aspects of climbing, technical aspects of descending and so on. So, or else find a coach who can help you with that. Uh, consider joining a training camp in the mountains um, early on, uh, if possible. We, 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 take, we always take people to Tenerife. We'll be there in, uh, in 10 days time for, uh, for an early season training camp, which is largely focused on, on technical skills as well, of course, uh, doing a block of training. One interval session per week. Um, there's no point in doing more at this point. Um, I would suggest at this time of year, uh, doing multiple four to eight minute efforts, that sort of range of interval, initially in zone three. So up to perhaps sweet spot, perhaps a little under sweet spot, more tempo than sweet spot. And then ultimately getting up towards um, threshold, uh, the anaerobic threshold now. Uh, and you could also, um, uh, do a, a series of intervals, uh, much shorter ones at higher intensity, so over threshold, one to two minute intervals uh, for that um, higher higher effort. It's at this time of year, it's a good idea to do at least some of those at low cadence. Uh, low cadence, I mean uh, below 55, maybe even below 50 uh, RPM, um, because that'll help with your, um, with your pedaling technique and also with your strength. But again, no more than one a week and be careful. You can uh, make sure your position on the bike is good because you can easily hurt your back, uh, your lower back uh, at low cadence like that. So be prudent about it. If you feel any pain, then uh, uh, back off the intensity or else uh, up the cadence. Okay, now this is uh, uh, often an unpopular subject. You know, if we're cyclists, it's because we love riding our bikes. We don't uh, necessarily particularly enjoy anything else. Uh, but sadly, this really is the best way to strengthen your muscles. Uh, it's off the bike. You can't strengthen them enough on the bike, um, sadly. It just doesn't work. Uh, so strength and conditioning is uh, very important if you want to uh, improve your performance on the bike. Um, just building your, 
your, your main muscle strength and of course your core muscles and all those small muscles which stabilize your, uh, your pelvis and your core and enable that, uh, that, that power from your legs to be directed into driving the bike forward. Uh, it, takes, uh, it, it takes a lot of a lot of time and effort in the gym, but it really does pay off. Uh, I can say that from experience. I strongly recommend it. Uh, now, it's technical, so you need to be guided by, a, if you don't know what you're doing, you need to be guided by a strength and conditioning coach, preferably with experience in cycling, so he's not going to uh, make you do exercises which are, which are not specially relevant. Um, but it's important to be guided because otherwise there's a very strong probability that you'll wind up injuring yourself. Okay, so be cautious about it. Um, but um, but not to the point of not doing it. I, I really strongly suggest that you 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 do some strength and conditioning work, a couple of sessions a week. Equally, mobility and flexibility. I think people are a little bit more accepting of this um, stretching, uh, obviously, to develop mobility uh, and um, and to prevent the or to counteract the the effects of. Uh, the imbalances which build up uh, in cycling because we use our muscles in a very particular and, and rather limited way. So again, learning correct technique is really important, uh, whether it's Pilates or yoga or something else, or just stretching, make sure you, you get yourself taught by a, uh, a specialist practitioner who knows cycling and knows what they're doing, um, and preferably will teach you either individually or in a very small group uh, so that, um, so, so that they, they, they have a good uh, eye on what you're doing. Again, I know from experience how much you can hurt yourself if you, if you uh, do this badly. And then complementary activities, it's not a good idea to, to uh, uh, just to cycle and even just to cycle together with, with what we're just talking about here. I recommend once a week or, or certainly once a fortnight, go for a swim, run if you're a runner, do not run if you're not a runner, that will probably injure you. Uh, but if you are a runner, by all means continue. Uh, swim, uh, go walking, uh, you know, anything that uh, at this time of year, if you live in the mountains, go um, cross-country skiing. Um, anything that's uh, uh, an endurance sport, you know, rowing, if you're a rower, great, great sport as well. Just to complement uh, what you're doing on the bike, just, to, just occasionally, just to get your body, use your body and your muscles differently uh, and, and counteract those imbalances I, I mentioned earlier. It's important for general health and, and staying, uh, staying fit long term. Okay, so that's it for the, the, the preparation phase. Now, the pre-competition phase, uh, the objectives are, um, uh, are uh, so this, sorry, we're now covering the period um, end of March to the middle of June. And the, so the key objective here is, is, of course, to increase your endurance and your training capacity. So now we're really going to, in a sense, put the pressure on as much as, as, much as possible. Um, a good goal here is to, if possible, is to move up to 15 hours of training a week. Uh, I know that's a big ask for people who are in full-time jobs and maybe with families, young families and so on. It's, it, it, it's frankly impossible for many people. Um, if, you, if you can't do 15 hours, well, you do as much as you can. If you can do 15 hours, great. If you can do more, it, all the better. You know, this is where it all becomes very, very individual. Second objective is to improve your climbing uh, at, um, at threshold, or not necessarily threshold, but a little faster anyway, at tempo, I, I should say, rather than threshold. And uh, to improve your general uh, race readiness as well. So that's your race reflexes, your ability to hold a wheel, your ability to change pace, uh, and so on and so forth, ride in a group, that type of thing. So those are the objectives of this period uh, here. So what to do? Uh, on the bike, um, so progress to long rides in, uh, you know, even longer, I should say, rides in, uh, in zone two. So if you, if you were able to work up to a six hour ride by the end of March, uh, that's all well and good. Now you want to build up to eight, nine, nine hours or possibly even more um, uh, with as much climbing as possible in the ride. Again, uh, you know, obviously that depends on where you live, but the more climbing you can build into the ride, uh, the better. Now, uh, these are necessarily um, at a low intensity. As no one could ride at high intensity for, for, for eight hours, it's obvious. Um, but they're also not usually club rides. Um, club rides are too fast and, and, of course, usually much shorter. They 
typically around four or five hours. So you have to do these rides either alone or if you can find an understanding uh, training partner, that's great. But make sure he or she understands that the, the objective is not to ride fast, but it's to do the distance and, and build that aerobic endurance. That's your goal. It's not riding fast at this, uh, at this point. Uh, you can add uh, once a week some multi uh, a ride with some multiple 10 to 30 minute efforts at, at uh, tempo or threshold um, just to develop your ability to climb at pace. Uh, there's really no need to structure this too much. Um, you can just push hard on all the climbs on a, on a two to four hour ride, for example. Um, you know, people get awfully hung up on the idea of it must be a 10 minute thresh, uh, effort and then I've got to stop. Uh, no, if the climb is uh, is an eight minute climb, well, you do an eight minute effort. If it's a 12 minute climb, you do a 12 minute effort. There's nothing magic about these numbers. They're just orders of magnitude. Okay, again, no more than one a week and less than that if you're fatigued. Do you, there's no point in doing these efforts if you're, if you're fatigued. It's better to take a, take a day's rest and then go out for another long ride to, 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 to keep building that base. Uh, do a sportive or a club ride um, perhaps a couple of times per month uh, during uh, in, in May and June. Uh, and this is, this is to get used to riding fast in, with, with people around you again, uh, to sharpen your reflexes, to hold wheels, um, to um, you know, manage those changes of pace and that sort of thing. Okay, again, recover, recover, recover. Make sure that you don't dig too deep a hole for yourself. Uh, it's, it's not always easy to know when you've gone too far, um, but pay careful attention to, to your sensations. And when you feel that you need to take a rest, you need to take a rest, huh? so, 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 so do it. Again, remember, you only get stronger when you're recovering, not when you're training. Now, also very important at this, uh, in this time is to start testing the different nutrition, hydration and uh, equipment choices that you might be, uh, you, that you're interested in and you might use on the day of the event itself. Okay, so you don't, you don't necessarily know what um, uh, food they will be providing, the mama, uh, people will be providing. At the moment, I don't know who, who will be the nutrition, uh, sports nutrition provider, um, but you can obviously test your own um, choices. Uh, don't be tempted the day of the race to buy something on the stands and then, uh, and then use it if you've never used it before. You just don't know, you know it, it could easily disagree with you and that will really spoil your day. Same with equipment. Um, you don't want to put on a brand new uh, um, uh, bib short, for example, for the day of the race and then discover after two hours that it's incredibly uncomfortable and you're getting saddle sores. Uh, so test everything exhaustively in advance. Uh, and that way, you know, when you come to the day that uh, you're good to go. Uh, again, in this period, it's important to continue training off the bike. The, the focus shifts. Uh, the goal is no longer to develop strength, but to maintain it. And it's no longer to develop mobility and flexibility, but to maintain it. So you can do a little bit less and uh, above all less intense. Um, so it's probably one session a week of strength and conditioning, one or two, uh, and one or two, uh, or probably still two of mobility and flexibility, because there's, there's no reason not to stretch for 15, 20 minutes, uh, two or three times a week. Okay. Again, the other activities are, are a bit, bit, a little bit optional, but I still recommend you you consider swimming once every couple of weeks, going for regular walks, or whatever you can do just to move your body differently. But now, now what becomes particularly important in this final two months where the training, is, uh, the training uh, uh, um, volume has, is really going up is to have a high um, quality of, of, of um, life, uh, what they say in French is uh, life hygiene. Uh, in, in other words, look after yourself. So the first is to get as much sleep as possible because that's crucial for your recovery and adaptation. You, you really, a lot of it goes on when you're sleeping. Uh, try to get eight hours of sleep at night. Try to wake up naturally without using an alarm clock uh, and uh, banish all screens from the bedroom so you're not tempted to do that last uh, late night check on Twitter or whatever it may be just before you go to sleep. Uh, so do that uh, you know, at, at nine o'clock and then um, and then read a book or something to, to calm you down uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, get ready to sleep. 
High quality nutrition is even more important than usual in this period due to the high training load. Okay, so the principles are obvious. It's not, I'm not gonna go into details here. Uh, avoid industrial food, avoid supplements unless your doctor tells you to take them uh, and eat the widest possible variety of fresh, top quality natural foods. That's, it's really no more complicated than that. And then try to minimize stress on your life that you're putting a lot of stress through your training Try to minimize other stresses. I, I know that's not always obvious, but if you can reduce your, if you can avoid traveling, if you can uh, try and keep uh, family life stress-free and so on, uh, the more, the, the better you can do that, the better off you will be. Recognizing that much of that is not in our control. So you just got to put up with what happens. But do recognize that external stress will affect your ability to train as well. Now, finally, we reach the competition phase. Uh, competition phase, this is the final two weeks. Uh, the goal here is, um, is really to eliminate fatigue without losing any fitness. You want to arrive on the start line as you know, the fittest you can possibly be, but also super fresh, and thus, thus able really to, to, uh, you know, to, to perform at your very best. Now, the longer the event, the harder the event, the longer the taper should be. So if, you, if you've tapered before for an event and it took uh, easier than the marmot and it took you, say, a week, well, you're going to need a little bit more for the marmot. Um, if it only took you two or three days and that was, work, that was good, well, maybe you only need a week to taper for the marmot. It's quite individual. There's no hard and fast rules. It's more, tapering is much more art than science, in fact. But the, the key is to uh, reduce the volume. Uh, the general guideline is to reduce the volume by 50%. So, so what varies most between people is, is the length of time during which you're gonna reduce the volume. But most people are gonna reduce the volume by 50%, you know, for either several days or, or, or even as many as 10 days or two weeks. And um, nevertheless, and to limit the intensity, but not to zero. It's nevertheless worth keeping a little bit of intensity uh, so that you don't uh, get completely out of the habit of, of pushing pushing hard. Okay, ideally, uh, you want to arrive in Alpajuez at least two to three days before the start. Uh, really, the earlier the better to make sure you haven't you know, you're over the stress of traveling uh, and that your bike's in good shape, everything's arrived, uh, and, and there are no issues. Uh, do a couple of short rides once you've arrived to spin the legs, but I, I wouldn't recommend doing anything strenuous. So it's uh, it's tempting to go and climb uh, Alpajuez, obviously, but honestly, I wouldn't recommend it two days before the marmot. Um, some coaches recommend doing a sort of wake-up ride with some short but really quite hard efforts the day before the event. Uh, it doesn't work for everybody, so be careful. I personally don't, uh, I only recommend that to someone who I know uh, has experience of it and it works for them. It doesn't work for me. The one time I tried that, I had a terrible day the following day. Uh, so what works for me is to take it, take it easy, spin the legs for sure, but to take it easy without doing anything uh, hard or violent on the previous day. But again, you will hear coaches recommend uh, that it's the best thing to do to so-called wake your body up for the, um, for the event. So it works for some, but be careful. Finally, in those uh, final two weeks, I've put a beach there just to symbolize it. Um, the need for sleep, for good quality nutrition, minimum stress and so on, all of that is, is even more acute in these final two weeks. So do everything you can to, to do all of that well, to set yourself up with the best possible chance for, uh, uh, for a good performance on the day. Okay? You know, this is constraint led, obviously you do what you can, but uh, at least you know what you, what, what you hope to do. So that brings us to the end. That's it. I've, I hope I've given you the principles and guidelines that uh, should allow you to prepare yourself well. Uh, now it's up to you to take them, um, create your own training plan, uh, and then follow it. Um, I'll answer any questions on the on the presentation. Obviously, if you've got any follow up questions, don't hesitate to send them to me by by email. Um, if you'd like us to go further, if you'd like some professional help to be absolutely your best. On, on the day, uh, then we can help you in a couple of different ways. Uh, the first is by joining one of our training camps uh, or coaching camps as we call them, uh, put, put an emphasis on the fact that we have uh, several professional coaches there who will 
coach you actively on your technique. Uh, there's one in Tenerife starting very shortly, starting in 10 days. Uh, um, uh, otherwise, we're, we're looking at uh, May, uh, the 22nd to 28th, where we'll be in the, around the Mont Ventoux area and the Luberon. Uh, that should be a wonderful camp. And then from the 4th to the 12th of June, we'll be in La Clusa, uh, just south of Geneva in the Northern Alps. And at the end of that week, uh, we'll be riding in the Megève Mont Blanc Sportive. So that gives the chance of uh, you know, learning, practicing and so on, and then really putting it into practice at the, end of the, um, at the end of the week. The other thing we can do for you, of course, is to is provide one-on-one -on -one coaching, which is fully individualized, fully personalized, takes into account exactly who you are, what your experience is, where you're coming from, what you need, uh, what your constraints are uh, and all the rest of it. So uh, delighted to do that if you're interested. And again, for questions, just uh, send them through. Thank you very much for listening through to the end. And um, I'll now open the floor to any questions that you may have immediately.